All right. The stage whisper. Face the other end, other end of the hall when I finish. We're not yet. Karen Garanch of Fayetteville is known in West Virginia and beyond for her storytelling, a plays based on oral history, living history presentations of American women, famous American women. She's performed throughout our state and around the country as a storyteller and at Chautauqua events portraying historical figures. Karen teaches theater and speech classes as well as Appalachian studies at Concord University. She's been honored for her work by organizations including the West Virginia Storytelling Guild, Tamarack, West Virginia Tourism Commission, and the Women's Commission of the West Virginia Legislature. The Humanities Council has had a long and fruitful relationship with Karen as she has been a, present a presenter in our popular and long-running History Alive program since the mid-1990s. History Alive brings important people from history to life through first-person portrayals by presenters who have done extensive research on the people that they portray. Over the years through this program, Karen has portrayed Mother Jones, uh, Clara Barton, Indian captive Mary Draper Ingalls, Civil War spy Emma Edmonds, as well as Pearl Buff. And currently she's on our roster appearing around the state as Julia Child, and she can, she can cook. <laughs> A big bonus in that, that part. Uh, just since 2010, the Humanities Council has delivered over 1,100 History Alive presentations statewide, including those by CARE, for schools, libraries, parks, museums, historical societies, and other such groups. If your group's interested in uh, a presentation, we'd be glad to hear from you. But at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the person who's the reason we are gathered together here in Morgantown. Please give a warm welcome to West Virginia's favorite Pulitzer Prize winner, Miss Pearl S. Buck. The dragon is an important figure in Chinese mythology. To a Chinese person, a dragon is not an evil creature, but a god, and a friend to those who worship him. I was born June 26, 1892, in the year of the dragon. It's important to me that I was born in West Virginia, the land of my ancestors, for it means that I am West Virginian by birth as well as ancestral history. It's also important to me that I was taken to China when I was only three months old, for it meant that my home was West Virginia, but my environment was Chinese. In this atmosphere so delicately and yet so profoundly poised between East and West, I grew to maturity. I often found myself explaining Westerners to Asians and Asians to Westerners. Oh, this was not difficult, for I belonged and still do belong equally to both cultures. As I said, I was just three months old when I went to China. I learned to speak Chinese before I spoke English. I came to love the Chinese people as my own, and they in turn loved me. But make no mistakes about it. The Chinese made no bones about the fact that my blue eyes were not a proper color. <laughs> and my hair, which was yellow, was considered quite unfortunate. <laughs> Just in case my nanny, Wang Ama, made a little hat to cover up the unlucky color of my hair. And just in case she embroidered a little Buddha right on the front in case that Christian God my parents worshipped would shirk his duty. <laughs> But I think it was this bicultural existence that brought me as an adult to understand racism, as very few white people in America truly can. For I know what it is like to be treated differently because of the color of one's skin, and I will fight all my life to end race prejudice wherever I find it. My friend Langston Hughes says that I am the Harriet Beecher Stowe of the 20th century. 
And Walter White, the executive secretary of the NAACP, said that only two white people in America truly understand the American Negro dilemma, and that is myself and my good friend, Eleanor Roosevelt. I think I came to this passion for ending racism because of my mother. As a child, I knew nothing of my, of my American heritage. I only knew what my mother's fervent, homesick patriotism told me, that America was the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I was so surprised to come and find the inequity here when I found them. My mother was truly a light in my life. The first book I ever wrote was about my mother. I didn't think it would be published. I simply wrote a memoir for our family. Of course, years later, it was published under the title of The Exile. And then my uh, public asked for a book about my father, and I wrote one called Fighting Angel about him. And it was these two books that were named for my Nobel Prize for Literature. And I'm glad I could take a piece of West Virginia with me when I went to Sweden to get that award. Oh, I've always considered myself to be a West Virginian. In China, it doesn't matter where you are living, but where you were born and where your people are from. From there, you take your citizenship and your nationality. So I've always considered myself to be a West Virginian, for I was born here as well as my people. Had I been given a choice of the place of my birth, I would have chosen right where I was born in my grandfather's large white house in Hillsboro, West Virginia, set with the beautiful mountains of the Pocahontas County Hills behind it. My mother's people had traveled there to escape religious intolerance in Holland. It must have been difficult. They were city people. And when they arrived, there was nothing but wild mountains and, and great forests. But they built a log house and one for their church. But it was the dream of my mother's grandfather that he have a house such as he left in Holland. And that is the house that stands there today. Twelve rooms, papered and plastered walls, long windows, for he was a watchmaker, and he himself with a light. It is that house that my mother grew up in. But she had a dream. She wanted to become a missionary to foreign lands, and she met a young man that shared her dream. Of course, his name was Absalom Seidenstricker, that was my father. He was a Presbyterian minister and had come to Hillsborough Presbyterian Church to preach uh, that Sunday. His brother was the regular pastor in that church. In fact, in the Seidenstricker family, there were six, seven boys and six were ministers. Well, well, five were Presbyterian and one, in the wildness of his youth, became a Methodist. <laughs> Now, my father had a dream to go to China, but his mother has said that he could not go to China till he had a wife to go with him to take care of him. And when they realized they shared a dream, they were married and set off on their new adventure. My father was so zealous about his calling that he, he forgot he was married and only purchased one ticket to China. They had to scramble on the platform to find a ticket for my mother. And my mother crossed the Pacific Ocean and came to see China for what it was and what it is to this day, a country of great contradiction, where the most beautiful in the world is inextricably bound with the saddest. This combination of beauty and sorrow would bind her most strangely to the land of her adoption at times, for she too experienced great joy and great sorrow. My mother gave birth to seven children, four of which died from the lack of medical resources available in that remote part of the world. Three died before I was born. My mother had been in China for 12 years, and my brother Edgar was her only surviving child. They came home to America for the first furlough of their missionary career, and that was when she realized she was pregnant with me and could stay in America near the doctor she obviously desperately needed. And that is how I came to be born in West Virginia. But as I said, I was just three months old when we returned. It was China that I knew as a child. China. A land of age-old nuances, ancient history and mythology. There were so many people that were important to me in China. I've already told you about Wang Ma. She was our nanny, and she came to us out of a deep human experience. 
She had given birth to a girl baby, and her husband, not wanting another girl child, had killed it upon its birth. She was still sobbing and holding the infant in her hands when my mother found her and brought her home to live with us. And she stayed with us for the rest of her life. It is she who told me stories and legend of Chinese culture. And today, I consider myself to be nothing more than a Chinese storyteller. And I credit Wang Ma with that gift. Mr. Kung was important to me as well. He was a Confucius teach scholar and teacher. He came to my home and taught me things like language and literature and mathematics. But he taught me a philosophy and a way of looking at the world that I have carried with me to this day. So you see, I had a very unusual upbringing. I had Presbyterian parents, a Buddhist nanny, and a Confucius teacher. <laughs> what do you do with that besides become a writer? <laughs> Of course, my parents were very important to me. My mother was impetuous and fun-loving, but most of all, she loved learning above all else. And I believe that I have carried that light in my heart ever since because of her love of learning. My father, however, well, seven children never taught him how to feed a baby or change a diaper. <laughs> no, he was born prophet and saint, dedicated to righteousness. And yet, somehow unable to make righteousness beautiful to us as children. I am glad, as an adult, I came to know the intellectual that he was, for he had a dream. My father longed to translate the Bible into Mandarin Chinese, not from English, directly from the Hebrew, for he was fluent in those languages as well as five others. But as a child, I simply could not understand why publishing one more chapter in Father's New Testament was more important than that doll I wanted from the Montgomery Ward's catalog. <laughs> there was another China that I knew growing up. It was a China that was disturbed politically. For many generations, white businessmen from Europe had come to China and treated the Chinese as if they were second class citizens in their own country. Well, for example, there was a park in Shanghai. Shanghai is a busy, dirty city. And in front of this park, there was a sign that said, no dogs or Chinese permitted. In China, with dogs written before the Chinese. No wonder they were resentful. No wonder we could feel their growing distrust. Even those of us who loved and respected them could feel that growing resentment. I was very young when the Boxer Rebellion erupted. My mother and I fled to Shanghai for safety. My father would not give up his proselytizing, and his life was in danger on more than one occasion. But finally, at the end of that year, the rebellion was quelled, and my mother decided to come home to America for a furlough. She had been in China for 22 years and only been home once. And we came home to Hillsborough, West Virginia. I shall never forget that year. I attended school in America. I played with my cousins in the beautiful fields and valleys of Pocahontas County. I ate grapes from my grandfather's front porch as I plucked them off the grapevine and read my beloved Charles Dickens books. I remember that my cousin was going to be confirmed in the Old Stone Church in Lewisburg, and she was going to get a new dress. Well, I told father that I too wished to be confirmed. <laughs> And he was so happy, I desired righteousness. He didn't know that I desired a new dress. <laughs> <laughs> but something else significant happened to me that year. I was 10 years old, and I had never before seen another white child outside of my family. It is an amazingly liberating feeling to realize you are not alone in this world. We went back to China, and the revolution that would eventually rock China did not come at that time. Still, peace covered China like a thin sheet of ice beneath which a river boiled. I continued my formative years and came home to college for four years in America, and then I had a decision to make. I was offered a job in the psychology research department but I found out that my mother was ill with the disease of sprue. 
Well, the only way for me to go back to China and care for my mother was to apply to be a missionary with the Presbyterian Mission Board. My parents could not support me. I was an adult. And I wasn't sure I wanted to tell people which God they should believe in. But I wanted to be near my mother. And so I applied to be a Presbyterian missionary in my own right and returned to China. It was a few years later I met a young man by the name of Lossing Buck. He was also with the missionary board, but not a pastor. He was an agricultural expert, sent to teach the Chinese modern farming technique. I agreed, had known him a very short time before I agreed to marry him, and my parents were not happy. They said that he was not an intellectual, and I was never without a book. But I wanted to get on with my life. I wanted to have a family and raise children, and so I agreed to marry Lossing Buck. And I will never forget the place to which I was transformed, for Lossing was stationed in North China. Now, I had always lived in Central China, and although it was rural, there was a lot of activity along the Yangtze River and the Grand Canal. But Northern China was truly rural peasant China. Very few Westerners had ever even been there. Now, Lossing, of course, could not speak Chinese, but it was my native language. So I became his translator going to those good people of the earth, telling them about the modern agricultural techniques. And I was so impressed with these people. And I decided that I would write a book about them. Oh, you see, I had always planned to be a writer since I was six years old and had my first piece published in a magazine in Shanghai. I wanted to be a writer. But I also knew that I wasn't old enough yet, that I had lived life to the fullest and could truly bring the best to that book. And besides, we were busy. After a few years, we were transferred to Nanjing, where we taught in the university, and, and then I found out I was to have a child. I can tell you, when I found out that I was pregnant, my joy rose to the height of my anticipation. I didn't know there would be only one. After Carol was born, there were complications, and I learned I could have no more children. And then it became apparent that something was wrong with Carol. Then began that long journey that only parents of retarded children truly understand. The monstrous ache of the heart that permeates your bones and your muscles. The end of my journey came in 1925. Lossing and I had come home to America to attend school at Cornell and get our master's degree, and I was determined I would find a cure for Carol. I would find a way to make her be normal, make her be like other children. I went to many doctors. Finally, it was at the Mayo Clinic. A doctor sat me down, and he said these words to me. You must give up hope. Your daughter will never be normal. She will never read or write. She will never be mentally older than four years old. My daughter has taught me so much. She has taught me that the mind is not the only thing that makes a person valuable. She has extraordinary integrity, and she loves books and poetry and music. And I love her with all my heart. As I said, this was 1925, and we were students, and we were poor because we were missionaries, and we were living on one salary at any rate. And so I realized I needed to make some money to pay back all those doctor bills. So I sent in a story I had written coming over on the boat from um, China to Asia Magazine, and it sold for $100. That was a lot of money in 1925. And then I found out the university gave prizes for essays. Well, I ruthlessly set out to find out which essay paid the most money. <laughs> it was an essay on an international topic. I was told, don't bother to apply. Only history students win that prize. But I submitted an essay on the effect of Western civilization on Chinese culture. I submitted it with a number as I had been assigned, and soon the word flew around campus that a Chinese student had won the prize, for only a Chinese could have written this essay. It was mine. And then my second story sold, and I finally had enough money to buy my first winter coat, which I had not been able to afford up to this time. 
in upstate New York that was quite important, let me tell you. <laughs> but more than that, I had a newfound faith in my own abilities. We went back to China at the end of that year, and I took something else with me, my first adopted daughter. She was in an orphanage, and we told she had what today is called failure to thrive. I took her and loved her, and today she's a happy, successful adult woman. How easy it is to watch children grow just by giving them your love. When we got back, we found out the Presbyterian Missionary Board would not make salary allowances for adopted children. So once again, money was, very, was needed, and so I wrote a little book, and I realized, not the book, not the book about the North China Plains yet. I wanted to try my hand at a novel first, and so I sent one off. I also realized I needed one, I needed an agent. Well, I went to a library in Shanghai and found the names of several agents. One is Carl Brandt, very famous man, of course, he's passed today, but his agency lives on. He wrote back and said, don't bother me, no one is interested in China. The other man's name was David Lloyd. I didn't know that he was bankrupt. <laughs> and so desperate he agreed to take my little book. He showed it to 44 different publishers. Each one said, don't bother us, no one is interested in China. Finally, the 44th publisher at the John Day Publishing Company said that this book wasn't really good, but the writer showed promise, and he would take my book. Now, I didn't know, my friends, I didn't know the things, the rejection I had gotten previously to that. I simply knew that now, now I was a writer. Now I could write that book about the North China Plains. And I began a book. But the book I began would never be finished or published. For this was 1927. The Communist Army and the Nationalist Army were fighting over who would control China. My sister had fled the Hunan province with her children and come to stay with us in Nanjing. It was March 1927, and I was making breakfast with no warning at all, a friend burst in the house saying, run for your lives. Even as we speak, they're killing all the white people in the streets. Where could we run to? There we stood, my aged father, my infant children, my sister and her children. We watched the soldiers pouring over the walls. And then, hobbling toward us on her bound feet, was an old woman, Mrs. Liu, whom I had helped on many occasions. She said, come, hide in my hut. If your children cry, I will simply pinch my own child so it cries, and the children, soldiers think it is my child that is crying. We went beyond the walls, and there were our good Chinese friends, and they said, come and hide. For 12 hours, we hid in that hut, listening to the soldiers looting and burning and pillaging in the walls beyond. And then our friends came and said, it's too late. Even now, they are searching the huts. And the soldiers came. They yanked us from the hut. And they took their guns, and they went to shoot us. And then one of the soldiers dropped a bullet. And my next-door neighbor, Claude, reached down, and with two hands, as is the proper way to give something in China, returned the bullet to the soldiers. The soldier was so disconcerted that these foreign devils, as they called us, new Chinese protocol, they decided not to kill us. They would kill us in the morning. They took us to a hostage center. And all night long, our good Chinese friends, at risk of their own lives, brought us food and clothing and blankets. And the next morning, the American gunboats were in the harbor of Nanjing to rescue the hostages. And we were taken to Shanghai with nothing but the clothes upon our back. I can tell you it's a strange feeling to escape with nothing but your lives and your children's lives. We lived in Japan for a few months, but eventually made our way back to Nanjing. Many of my friends' homes had been burned to the ground, but they had been built in the Western style. But our house remained standing, for it had been used as a hospital for cholera victims. I had a great deal of work to clean it up, but of course everything that I owned had been taken. And then. One by one, my Chinese friends brought back the things they had only pretended to steal. Small pieces of furniture, clothing, and books. A blue willow platter that had belonged to my mother that today is in the house in Hillsboro, West Virginia. And high upstairs, in a cupboard too heavy to move, 
back in the back, wrapped in oil skin, was that book I had written about my mother that would later be published and called The Exile. I think it was this close brush with death that intensified my desire to write. The book I had been writing had been destroyed by the soldiers, so I began a new one. I poured all of my thoughts and my feelings into that book. I called it Wang Lung. Today, you call it The Good Earth. It was an instant success, astonishing me beyond words. It was a bestseller immediately, that year and the next. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It won the Howells Medal. When my agent wrote and told me these things, I said, thank you very much, but I must go back to my dusting. I don't know what that means. When I was told I would be in the Book of the Month Club, I said, I don't belong to your club. I don't think you'll want me. You must understand, I was a sheltered missionary's daughter and wife. When I came home to America for a book tour in the early 1930s, I was besieged. It was as if I had become an unofficial spokesperson for an entire culture of people. My publisher, Richard Walsh, kept the people at bay, but it, it was as if no one before had ever talked about China. In fact, in, near, as we neared the war with Japan, the United States sent out a survey asking what people knew about China, for China was at war with Japan nine years before we were, and now they would be our ally against Jap Japan. 90% of Americans replied they only knew about China what they had read in Pearl Box books. My life was changing in so many ways, not at the least the fact that the Japanese aggressors were all throughout China, and a war-torn country is no place to raise your daughters. And so I chose to come home to America. Lossing stayed in China. I can only say this, that for 18 years, I gave all that I could emotionally and materially. And for 18 years, I received nothing in return. I hate to say it, but my parents were right. <laughs> my marriage was over, and on my part, it was over honorably. A few years later, I did marry again my publisher, Richard Walsh. <laughs> We became quite a team. We bought the John Day Publishing Company, and, and um, I be, be, uh, became, uh, worked there, and he be, continued to be my editor. I published at least a book a decade in those days. I remember one time in 1938, I took a phone call, and I laughed, and I hung up. He said, who was that? I said, oh, it was a joke. He said, what well, was a joke? I said, somebody just called and told me I'd won the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> I had. An American woman had never won this prize before. Furthermore, it made me, at least in my lifetime, the only woman to receive both the Pulitzer and the Nobel Prize. Now, most people think that I won the Nobel Prize for the Good Earth, but in fact, it was the two books about my West Virginia missionary parents that were named, as well as, the Academy said, the body of her work. And bookstores were besieged the next day with requests for Pearl Buck's new book the body of her work. <laughs> but I also received a great deal of criticism. People said that I was a woman and should not have won. They said that I wrote for women and therefore my work was unimportant. They said that Theodore Dreiser should have won the prize. In fact, Theodore Dreiser wrote to me and told me he should have won the prize. <laughs> be careful when you become famous, for you will be attacked. The Academy did not take into account solely my work as a writer, but the fact that I was an active humanitarian. I spoke out to free India from British rule. I spoke out against Japanese internment. And yet, because I was a woman, I was considered unimportant. Well, I owned a publishing company. I could publish what I wished. And so I published four books under the pseudonym of John Sedges. And he was, the, John Sedges was hailed as a new and important American young writer and then I revealed it was I who had written those books. I will always fight for the rights of women. I was appalled when I came home to America and found out that women were treated as they were here. But most of all, I was appalled at how the, the Negroes of my country were treated. All they wanted in World War II was to be given honorable jobs, and yet they were given demeaning construction jobs. And I told them, we must fight for two victories, the double V campaign, victory over the war and victory over discrimination in America. I said that if we continue to allow discrimination in this country, we are fighting on the wrong side of this war. 
We belong with Hitler. The shadow of racism is, is over us all, and it's darkest over those of us who allow its evil influence to continue. I realize there are people in whom racism is ingrained. But if that is so, we must not allow those people to violate our nation's democracy. A truly democratic nation must ensure that all people have freedom, not merely freedom from fear, not merely freedom from want, but the great freedom to be free. I would fight, I would die, I would go to prison for you, for me, for anyone. That is my only creed. As you can imagine, my belief in ending race prejudice and segregation did not, was not popular with everyone in this country. And after the war, I received more unpopularity for I had supported Chiang Kai-shek during the war. He was our ally. But when the war was over, I began to speak out and say we must keep the lines of communication open with Mao Zedong for he was truly going to be the leader of China. I was told I was a communist for supporting him. I want to say now there is not a communist drop of blood in my body. I simply learned a valuable lesson. My father had taken me through Russia in 1910 and said, look around. Their first revolution in this world will be in Russia, for the peasants are treated so badly. And I knew that Mao Zedong treated the peasants with respect, while Chiang Kai-shek was corrupt and did not respect the peasants. And because of my statements such as these, I was often marginalized and ignored and told that I was a communist. Luckily for me, my voice was heard in other places. And so I began to work for children's issues. I grieved I could not have many children of my own. And so we began to create uh, opportunities for children to be adopted. Welcome House was a foundation that created a place for children to be adopted that were considered unadoptable by racial children, sibling groups, older children, mentally challenged children. And then I began to hear about children in Asia that were fathered by American servicemen and forgotten. You see, Asia is a culture that values purity above all else. And a child born to mixed race is considered impure and forgotten and tortured and starved to death. The Pearl S. Buck Foundation has helped those children by offering adoptions but also integrating them into society in Asia. Of course, I believe in putting my money where my mouth is. Richard and I adopted six more children, and I served as a foster parent for an additional five. I've raised 12 children in all. It's a lot, very difficult to do, and I can do it because my voice is heard. I have written almost 100 books. I have written 70 short stories. I have written 200 articles, 11 plays, and produced 16 films with my film production company. And my voice is translated, my work, books are translated into 60 different languages, more than any other writer in my day. Recently, I picked up a book I had begun some time ago, and I wonder why I did that. I know why because it is about China, and we are in communication again with my other country. Can there be understanding where there is such difference? They are so old, and we are so very young. Yes, I, I think there can be. And today the title floated into my mind, All Under Heaven. It's part of an ancient Chinese phrase that says, all under heaven are one. No, it's not the complete title. It just says all under heaven. I leave it that way because that is the way that it is. I am but a solitary woman sitting lonely at my desk. People's under heaven. I can but give you my book. It is up to you to complete the title with all of its meaning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
Now, I know it sounds like the program's over, but actually, sit down, sir, because I'm not quite done. <laughs> no, I want to say thank you. I'm so deeply touched. Oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. Thank this you. is the best part of this whole conference. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to start crying. Thank you. Now, normally in these programs, we offer a chance for questions. And so you, I'd like to invite you to ask questions of Pearl Buck, but you are such an august group that I would like you to be gentle with me. <laughs> Any questions that you might have, I can answer as Pearl Buck, and then we can come forward in time. That this, this program is a three-part monologue, monologue and questions and questions. So. Any questions at all? Of course, we've been questioned out for the past two days, have we not? Yes, sir. Is this the first time you gave this performance? Oh, heavens no. <laughs> <laughs> I've, no, no. <laughs> I think it should be repeated many more times and uh, uh, hopefully in China as well. Well, that would be lovely. Yeah. Well, let me come forward in time then, since I think we've already <laughs> made this change. Normally, yes, ma'am. Can you tell us the rest of the story about your daughter? The rest of the story? Your, your first daughter. About Carol? Well, let, let me answer and stay in character for a moment. Um, Carol, of course, uh, we have found out in years to come that she had something called PKU syndrome. So you are, she, they are born normal, and then they, this enzyme that's missing causes mental retardation. Actually, I have spent a great deal of money funding uh, physicians to find out how to prevent PKU syndrome, and it was a woman doctor from WVU that found the, the cure for PKU uh, syndrome, which is a guess. <laughs> So what, my sister was in the hospital giving birth, and a nurse came to her and said, I just wanted to meet Pearl Buck for, because of Pearl Buck, we have effectively eradicated PKU syndrome in America. We found the cure for it. A way to, it's called the diaper test. You all know that, right? When, when you have a child, you, you have the diaper is tested for this enzyme. Carol, um, in those days, there was no such thing as special education did not exist. Everyone told me, put her aside, put her in an institution and forget about her. I simply would not do that. When I realized that there was no way to give her the schooling that she apparently needed, I traveled to many, many schools in America, and I found Vineland, which is in Vineland, New Jersey. And it was a school that was very progressive. It um, had many, many children, small, small cottages with a few children of the same age and sex and mental capacity. And unlike many places had huge rooms this big with hundreds of bunk beds and a child would never be taken out uh, but every five days. So Vineland was quite progressive. Today we think it's normal, but it was, I was very impressed with it. And so Carol will live there for the rest of her life. I have endowed Vineland. It will last as long as society lasts. And I have chosen to live at Green Hills Farm so I can easily get to Carol to see her. Some other questions? Well, let's come forward in time. I think you know I'm not really Pearl Buck. Did I fool anybody? Okay. <laughs> My name is Karen Varanch, as, as uh, Ken told you. I have been performing Pearl Buck since 1992, so that's a very long time. But I actually have not performed her much recently because um, uh, there's not been as much call for her. I hope that this, this um, uh, gathering does spark some more interest in Pearl, not just for me to do this, but so we can talk about this amazing woman. Uh, she was one of the most important women in America. I don't need to tell you that. And um, I, it's my honor, it's my great honor to be able to perform this character. Any questions for me at this point or for Did yes. you graduate from the acting department? I did. I have a not, not WVU. I do have a degree in theater. I, I teach theater at another university here in the state, Concord University. And um, I've been, I was, um, I had my own acting company for 25 years before I began to teach. So I have been traveling around and, and doing these kinds of shows, as Ken said. I'm a storyteller and an actress and a historian, and, um, and I have a degree in theater so, and humanities. My master's is humanities. So um, there was a hand. Yes, sir. I have learned so much from Pearl Buck. I've learned so much from all the characters that I do, but I think Pearl has, is nearest to my heart because I am she's so passionate about ending racism and fighting for equality and for women's rights. And um, I think what I've learned is to, to not be afraid to speak up when it's important to speak up, to not worry about what's the criticism that may come. 
She said one time that, that I, I get criticism all the time, it rolls off me like, a, like water rolls off a duck's back. So, yes. What were her views on religion? Well, of course, she was raised Presbyterian, and as well as Confucius and Buddhist. Um, as she grew older in life, she, she wasn't necessarily Presbyterian. She was so, sort of an amalgamation of all those things. But at one point, she was in 1932, she was asked to go to speak to the Presbyterian Missionary Board. And about her experiences in China, and she told that she she planned. She thought she'd speak to the board members. She didn't know it would be at the Waldorf Astoria with a thousand people there. And she said, "Well, it's okay. I planned this speech for three months. I'm going to say the speech." And she told them that it, essentially the missionary movement was effective, as effective as drawing a finger through water. When you remove the finger, it's nothing remains. They began trial charges for heresy. The next, the, uh, the next month. She was, tried, she was charged for heresy. Lucky for her, a man who would later become important in her life, Ernest Hawking, a Presbyterian minister, had also been to China and came back and said the same thing. Until we start dealing with uh, food and clothing and schooling, we cannot start talking about proselytizing and talk, talk about um, the church. And so because this man had said that, the charges for heresy were dropped. She formally ends her relationship with the Presbyterian church at that time. And uh, the rest of her life, she, she wrote a very important article about the similarities between Christianity and Buddhism. And I think her own uh, personal belief was a, a, just an amalgamation of the Eastern religion and a generic Christian religion. Is that? Yes, in the back. What she read, uh, well, certainly she grew up with Charles Dickens, and that was a really important influence in her early life. And then, of course, she, um, she also did love the, the work of Linda Tang, the, the Chinese writer. That was one of her favorite authors. She um, was very supportive of women writers. I, I don't know any specific, her favorite book of her own books was The Mother, mm -hmm. which is part of the Good Earth series. It's not, it's not actually part of the trilogy, but it's written about the same time. And um, I personally like the Pavilion of Women. I think that's one of my favorites. But um, <laughs> yes, right. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the pa Pavilion of uh -huh. Women. Uh -huh. In that novel, I think she expressed her view on Christianity through uh, Andrew uh -huh. very well. He said, um, you know, God is one supreme being. It may have many names. Uh, people may look at God from different angles. We see only part of God. But uh, don't try to interpret and believe that what you saw was the entire, the entirety of God. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's 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 a beautiful book, beautifully written book. Again, I'm I know that you all know as much, maybe more than I do. So it's so. Um, any other comments or questions? Ken, I'll give it back to you. Do you want to? Do? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are we done? Are we done? Okay, I'm turning it off. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, I'm so touched. Uh Thank you.